And I want to thank you for joining us for our uh, banquet today. I want to thank our panel, panelists for joining us uh, as we discuss the Anabaptists in light of uh, Dr. Yarnell's lecture on the Anabaptists and the Great Commission yesterday in chapel and his, uh, the lecture he'll deliver tomorrow on Anabaptism and the Cross. And so I want to thank Dr. Yarnell for coming uh, from for Southwestern all this way to join us. I want to thank Dr. Hammett, who was uh, my teacher uh, when I was in seminary here in 1996, 97, and then again in the PhD program in the early 2000s. And then we want to thank the man <laughs> of the fashion hour, the tower of historical theological power, too sweet to be in a Baptistically sour, Dr. Stephen, <laughs> for joining us. This, this so. is what I deal with. <laughs> so um, here's, here's what we'll do. <clears throat> we want to leave plenty of time for interaction with the audience. This is a really fun panel and so much to be learned, but I'll kick off by asking one question to each panelist, and then we'll open the floor. Do we have a, a microphone, somebody who will run, run the microphone for us? Uh, yeah, we do. We've got two microphones here, roving microphones, as they say. And uh, when you ask your questions, we ask that you keep them to about uh, 26 syllables, if you will. Um, if you're a friend of Dr. Eckers, you get 28. Um, no, we'll just ask you, if you can, to uh, state your question as briefly as you can, given the question, and then we'll uh, have a good time uh, as the panelists uh, respond. So the first question I want to give is to Dr. Yarnell, and wanted to ask if you would talk a little bit about the Anabaptists and their view of Scripture and the authority of Scripture? <clears throat> you know, it's, I think it's important to remember that one of the academic uh, descriptions for the Anabaptists um, has been uh, the Radical Reformers. And, of course, they are a subgroup of the Radical Reformation. But as Radical Reformers, uh, they are Reformers. And so when you come to the major doctrines of the Reformation, uh, they would agree with the magisterial reformers with regard to justification by faith, but they're going to be more radical because they're going to demand uh, not only that you have faith, but you, that you show faith. And so you, you must demonstrate it in a life of discipleship. If you have been justified by grace through faith, it will show itself in sanctification. Um, they also uh, held uh, to the priesthood of all believers, not just as a theory, uh, but as a practice. Um, but they also came to an understanding of Scripture that is slightly different from that of the magisterial reformers. Uh, the, uh, the historical tag has been sola scriptura. I think a, a better tag would be that of uh, James Leo Garrett's suprema scriptura. I mean, you're always going to be dealing with reason and tradition and experience uh, within uh, your uh, theological authorities. But for the radical reformers, they're going to take sola scriptura and they're going to drive it even more uh, than, the, um, than the magisterial <laughs> reformers did. Uh, I'd like to read you just a little bit uh, out of uh, interactions, one interaction with Luther, one interaction with the reformed, and then one interaction with Roman Catholics <clears throat> to give you a bit of a flavor here of what uh, they were dealing with. And so they're emphatic that there is a crucial distinction to be maintained between tradition, human tradition, and Scripture, uh, the divine word. Uh, scripture holds in judgment all human theologies without respect for particular men or movements. Uh, during his trial before the Austrian Catholic authorities, Sattler uh, and the others were accused of following Lutheran teaching, uh, but they denied it. As an early commentator noted, and this was actually a Lutheran, uh, for what they were concerned with was not Luther's word, but God's word. Mm -hmm. uh, not only was Lutheranism judged by God's word, and so was Reformed theology. In 1525, Zwingli crafted his argument for infant baptism as a parallel of Old Testament circumcision in response to Anabaptist arguments regarding uh, baptism and covenant. Uh, and so he rushed his little book off of his desk uh, quickly to St. Gall uh, so that the reformers there would have an official answer to the Anabaptist arguments. Uh, and uh, Wolfgang Ullemann, uh, the Anabaptist martyr and an early advocate of baptism by immersion, uh, responded whenever they brought forward Zwingli's book. And these are his words, if you have Zwingli's word, we want to have God's word. Mm -hmm. And so... Commentary is not 
necessarily authoritative uh, for them at all. And when they discover a disingenuous interpretation, they're more than willing to call it out, even if they are considered to be a, a scholarly or a Reformation authority. Um, and when you come to, the, uh, to, to their treatment of the Roman Catholics, at one point uh, there was a, an Anabaptist who was responding to a priest that was defending this idea of the real presence in the Mass. And an Anabaptist cried out in response, we won't have the argument from philosophy, you shall argue by the gospel. So don't give us Aristotle, uh, give us uh, the gospels themselves. And so I, I bring that forward to demonstrate that for them, they, I mean, you could really describe them as biblicists. I don't think in a negative way. Uh, but in a positive way, they are going to uh, make sure that Scripture remains the final authority, even for their own teachers. And that, uh, I, I think, is, is really refreshing, for me at least. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Hammett, would you take a moment and talk to us a little bit about misperceptions, which abound, yeah. misperceptions about the Anabaptists? <clears throat> well, this brought home to me this past week. I was a teaching a theology class at my church on Wednesday nights, and we you know, dealt with uh, uh, soteriology and Luther. And I had one of my, my students, an uh, intelligent young man, he uh, went out and, and read some of, about Luther. He came back with a comment about the Anabaptists. They were kind of weird, weren't they? <laughs> and again, uh, think about that. Here's an intelligent man, uh, a mature Christian, not very well, very well read in theology, and he hears Anabaptists, and has them as weirdos. Mm -hmm. And a, a couple of misperceptions there, I think, have, have grew up about them because of, of a couple of unfortunate incidents. One, of course, the Anabaptists got authority in the town of Munster. They took over there, and they either compelled the other folks to be converted or, or be imprisoned or, or executed, and they reinstituted polygamy, all types of wild stuff. And uh, that earned the Anabaptists uh, the universal hatred of almost everyone in Europe. Lutherans and, and Catholics, they didn't grip on much, but they agreed the Anabaptists had to go. And so uh, the idea that they were disturbers of the peace, they were uh, radicals, there were some of them, they were on their French in terms of eschatological expectation, those types of things. And so uh, sometimes uh, we, we too quickly write them off as simply radicals, weirdos, uh, revolutionaries, those types of things, when a lot of them were simply serious Christians trying to understand God's word like he said and follow it. So, so Dr. Acker, you and I have had conversations several times about mm -hmm. the, the way uh, uh, your thinking about Anabaptism yeah. has evolved over the years. Uh, so could you start us with your MDiv and then, mm -hmm. uh, or even earlier, mm -hmm. I don't know, and then work us up to where you are yeah. today. Yeah, thank you for that. So, yeah, my first interaction with uh, the Anabaptists was in college uh, as I was studying religion. <laughs> Uh, we watched the movie The Radicals. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. Uh, it is, it's like a B-quality movie. It's, it's tremendously <laughs> awful. Um, it's one of those things that you, you gotta kind of have to revisit time and again just to remind, remind yourself how bad it is. But uh, the, the, the thing I remember the most about that was just the, the depiction of, of Michael Sattler's death scene. Yeah. Um, and uh, I forget exactly what you said yesterday, Dr. Yarnell, in terms of your lecture, but um, the, the description of, of his execution was... Um, in some respects, it's beyond words, it's beyond comprehension. Uh, but I came here then as, a, as an MDiv student, that kind of in the background, and eventually over the years as I started landing on kind of a passion and a love for the Reformation period, uh, the Anabaptists were, were a people that resonated well with me. Uh, when I started reading uh, in the history books, when I started finding that these are these are folks that believe in the separation of church and state and the regenerate church and believers' baptism. I was like, these are my peeps. I love them. Um, I, I, I love their, their defiance and, and so on. Uh, but what, what I, I came to learn, and I guess this is where some of, the, some of the development of my thought on this was, is that I came to learn that uh, over time as I, as I began to study them more and more in their context, as I began to get into the primary sources and not just rely on what other figures, other historians had said about them, I found that they actually got to those convictions that I hold and that we as Baptists hold in a very different way. 
Um, and they, they get there through their story, their unique story coming out of the 16th century. And so um, part of their story is really to remember that even though we are talking about a group that is known for their separatism, their, um, their protest, their dissent, uh, they are dissenters of the 16th century, they were once uh, trying to reform the church from within. They were originally magisterial reformers. You know, remember this. These were, these were figures like um, Grebel and Mons and um, Ruetli and so on who were trying to reform the Swiss state church. That eventually proves too much for them. It proves to be a failure uh, in, their, in their respects. And the thing that so fascinates me about this is the way that their journey then actually, I think, ties in very strongly with what's going on today in the 21st century as it relates to evangelicalism. Uh, I, I tweeted out a couple of years ago uh, in the midst of, of one of our presidential elections that with every election cycle uh, in America, Anabaptist studies become more and more <laughs> relevant. Mm. Uh, and the reason that I believe that is because what had happened with the Anabaptists were they were the majority. They had the ear of Zwingli and Bullinger and the major Swiss reformers. They were the ones who were in charge of, of, of training up and leading the Swiss church. But the more they followed what Dr. Arnell says, the more they followed the word of God, the more that they continued to believe uh, the things that they had been taught by their, their leaders, like, like Huldrych Zwingli, the more that actually pushed them to the margins of society and culture. And so as I think about that, one of the things that, that has always resonated with, with me about the Anabaptists was the more that they got pushed to the margins of society, the more that they became forced to embrace some of the things that we take for granted with them, like separatism and stuff like that, um, the more that I realized that they actually got some very important stuff right uh, about the very foundations of the gospel, uh, the foundations of the faith, and so on. And so, you know, they learned, for instance, just through their experience that it's not, it's not political power, but it's, it's personal piety and persuasion that is going to be the effective means of the transforming power of the gospel. That it's not going to be a... Uh, it's not going to be a state church coercing people to believe. It's actually going to be a communal people living together, life together, in a separate, distinct, a unique way that's going to be a testimony to what Christ not only did but was doing in, uh, in their lives. And so just the, the parallels with that are, are just, for me, are fascinating. Uh, and then the other thing that really stands out to me in this, going tying in with what, what Dr. Yarnell said, they believed so passionately uh, in the transforming power of the Word of God. Now, I would contend they got that from Zwingli. <laughs> that, that was, I mean, he was, he was thoroughly committed to, uh, to the Word of God and, and to the, the power of the Scriptures. That's, that's, what, that's what ultimately brought about the change in Zurich in the, uh, in the 1520s. But what inevitably happened is as they began to be forced more and more to the margins, pushed to the edges of their culture, uh, they began to appropriate the same text of Scripture that they valued, but they began to look at it in a different way. Uh, and what they eventually did uh, was they began to look at the Scriptures. They began to read the Scriptures through a lens of persecution through a, uh, a lens of, uh, of suffering and so on. And so just, just think with me for a minute. The Anabaptists are known very well for uh, their, uh, their belief in and their uh, kind of the, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount as being sort of a hermeneutical lens in which to get at uh, the, the content of Scripture. So, so think about some of these Beatitudes from a people who are living persecuted and looking at the text now on the basis of their experience of the margins. Uh, Jesus said, of course, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I think about there. Could you imagine um, what this text meant to those Anabaptists who had watched their leaders, their parents, uh, give up their, their, their lives for the faith? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall uh, inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for 
for they shall receive mercy. And they, you, you frame this against the backdrop of a, a Swiss state church that was anything but merciful to them. I mean, Dr. Hammond brought this up. The Anabaptists were hated by everyone. Uh, the, the civil authorities couldn't stand them. The Roman Catholics despised them. Uh, all of the magister reformers uh, wouldn't tolerate them. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This, this was certainly a people of peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Think of how those texts would have resonated with this people as they were continually ministering living in the margins of life. And I can't help but wonder now, uh, Dr. Ashford, even in, in our context, you, you can see evangelicalism trying to cling to sort of a cultural Christianity, this veneer of a, of a Christian America, right? Um, but what would it be like for us to embrace and reappropriate? It doesn't change the meaning of Scripture, but in some ways it, it changes the way in which we appropriate it and we apply it and we think about what would it be like for us to be a set-apart people who are, who are actually witnesses to the transforming power of the gospel in our mm. communities. So I don't have anywhere near the expertise that you do on the Anabaptists, but you know, I just wanted to mention <clears throat> my experience was similar. I, I didn't even know about the Anabaptists until I came here to Southeastern, and one of my professors gave me uh, Estep's The Anabaptist mm. Story, which is a fine book, and that sort of opened the door for me. Mm. But it was uh, when I was serving as a missionary for a couple of years, I decided to take a Reformation tour. I booked it myself on the internet in 1998. Uh, you should have not done that in 1998. It was, the accommodations were awful, but um, I went to Prague and <clears throat> Lutherstadt Wittenberg in Geneva. And it was in Prague that I read a couple of books on Anabaptism and really began to take in uh, their stories. Mm -hmm. And remember that Balthazar Hubmeyer had his beard salted with gunpowder and was burned, you know, from the face down. And it was what you're talking about, the fact that they were hounded from their homes and persecuted. And it just gave me so much, I think, you know, uh, respect for them. And I think Dr. Ecker's analogy is exactly right. When Jesus looked at his disciples in John's version of the Great Commission and said, As the Father sent me, so I send you. He meant a number of things, but one of the things he did, one of the clues in the text, is he, he had just showed them the holes in his hands and his side. Mm. Mm. And uh, so I do think the Anabaptists help us to realize that our minister, the, the normal Christian life is one where we minister from the margins. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we minister from the center of power in a society, but it should be, it's been a normal thing for Christians all through the ages to minister from the margins. Mm. So. We, why don't we do this? We've, uh, we've got a pretty good bit of time left. We've got about 30 minutes or so. And let's open the floor for questions. And really any question you've got related to Anabaptism or uh, some of the central doctrinal tenets of Anabaptism, anything is uh, within bounds. And so who, who will be our first interrogator? This is... Thank you. If you will, state your name and uh, maybe what discipline you're, you're studying in and then uh, direct your question to a particular panelist. Uh, my name is Brian Mid uh, in Systematic Theology. And I guess my question, um, I know Southern Baptists have typically uh, borrowed a lot from Reformed theology. Um, but I, I guess moving on to, to my question related to Anabaptism, are there... Uh, contemporary Anabaptists that maybe uh, Southern Baptists uh, have engaged? Are, are, are there points of agreement um, even among Baptists and Anabaptists like today? I guess would be my question. So let's, uh, we'll direct this first one to uh, the whole panel. Somebody <laughs> take it away. Anyone who wants to respond. I, um, I have found that um, as far as Southern Baptist interaction uh, with uh, Anabaptists, there has been an ongoing tradition of interaction uh, with the Anabaptists, uh, stretching back pretty early uh, into, Southern, into at least the late 19th century. Uh, 
Uh, and before that, you can, you can find uh, British Baptists uh, citing the Anabaptists as uh, not necessarily as any type of, of uh, forefather, uh, but as uh, you know, people on the same journey uh, in reading Scripture and implementing Scripture. And, uh, but there have been scholars, and, and it has been more of a minority tradition. It has not been the majority tradition. Uh, mostly our scholars have interacted with Reformed uh, theologians. Um, today, interaction with uh, descendants of the Anabaptists, I want to make a distinction between the descendants of the Anabaptists and the Anabaptists because persecution, um, pietism, uh, you know, uh, different political systems under which the ancestors, uh, the more direct ancestors of the Anabaptists uh, have survived, have forced them into different molds in many ways. Uh, so uh, the ones that are uh, nearest us, of course, are Mennonites in uh, the United States and Canada. And they tend to be pacifistic. Um, uh, some of the, they did have a strong conservative theology uh, up until recent years, but uh, there is a strong liberal streak now within uh, American Mennonite theology. Uh, there are uh, conservatives, but, but not many. The, the Hutterites tend to be more conservative, um, and I've had interactions with both of those. I have a Ph.D. student who is a Hutterite, actually, at, uh, at Southwestern Seminary. And uh, there are also uh, more modern attempts. Uh, Stuart Murray uh, in Great Britain um, has been leading a uh, kind of an Anabaptist <coughs> revival among non-Anabaptists. And so there's just a great appreciation uh, for uh, the Anabaptist witness in many ways of what uh, Dr. Ecker described uh, here uh, in a... Um, in a minority context within a broader society are people who are really serious about following Jesus. And so I would point uh, to those as uh, three different manifestations. Uh, and a fourth, if I could add, would be the uh, Russian-German Mennonite experience. And so there were a number of uh, German Mennonites that under Catherine the Great uh, moved into areas of the Ukraine and into Russia and uh, became uh, financially prosperous. Uh, and so they had freedom. Uh, they knew how to till the land. Uh, they took their skills with them and they became very uh, wealthy. Uh, during the Soviet uh, experiments, um, uh, some of them were suppressed, but after World War II, because they were primarily German-speaking peoples in the Soviet Union, they had severe persecution, and they were scattered, uh, Kazakhstan to Siberia, um, and uh, taken out of their homelands. Um, but what was interesting is under the Soviet uh, uh, regime, they were forced into the same denomination with uh, other free churches, Baptists, Pentecostals, uh, um, and a brethren and so on. And many of the Mennonites ended up uh, serving in the military. Uh, so there were a number of Mennonites who became high-ranking generals and admirals in the, uh, in the Soviet military. Uh, so that now, uh, after the demise of the Soviet Union, and even before then, a number of those German communities began to migrate back to Germany such that they are actually the largest evangelical denomination within Germany. Germany has been decimated by liberalism, but the Russian-German uh, Baptists slash Anabaptists slash Mennonites are uh, some of the uh, most dynamic Christians there. And I have been able uh, to teach at one of their seminaries uh, for several years, and I can tell you that it's... It's just a work of God. It really is. And they even distinguish themselves. They call themselves the Russian Germans, whereas the German German Baptists are actually becoming evangelical, more evangelical due to their influence. And so that would be a fourth uh, community. One person that has been influential in certain areas of conversation, John Yoder, uh, Minot Scholar, and so especially in terms of interacting with culture, and the things that they were mentioned in terms of being separatistic, uh, 
being a, a pious community, those types of, of ideas have been influenced some. But in terms of, of uh, core doctrines, Mennonites have moved to the left of us, and so we haven't as much direct interaction with them, with, with some exceptions like Yoder. Yeah, yeah I had um, a lot of experience and interaction with this personally in my own life. When I was I actually spent a number of years in Indiana, um, when I was in high school and college, my roommate at, uh, at college at a state university uh, was a Mennonite. Uh, and as well, I spent a lot of time at the library in Goshen, Indiana, with Mennonites uh, when I was when I was working on my PhD. Uh, what what I find most fascinating, especially with the, with the, the Mennonites, uh, particularly as a denomination here in in, the, in America, is that sadly they um, there is a lot of interaction that still goes on in, in academic circles and so on. But I look at the way in which the denomination has shifted, and they've. And, these two gentlemen have alluded to the fact that they have theologically begun moving very left uh, in terms of their theology. But also, even some of the foundational things uh, that made Anabaptist life so, so vital and, uh, in the 16th century was some of their moral underpinnings, uh, their communal life together, um, and seeking a life of ongoing repentance and moral mm -hmm. improvement uh, that was very characteristic of the Anabaptists in the 16th century. Uh, and now what you find is uh, you find really a veneer of that, mm -hmm. that they sort of, in some respects, the theology talks about that, but in practice they don't, they don't do that. Uh, they're, uh, you know, for instance, that they still... Kind of in the Mennonite tradition, there's oftentimes this idea of, of the children kind of being raised in these communities, but then sending them off to just lose their minds on their own and then make a decision as to whether they want to embrace this or not. Uh, I mean, my, my roommate at college, for instance, he had never touched alcohol before he got to Ball State. Uh, and I don't know that there was maybe a week that went by that he wasn't, uh, you know, that he was sober maybe one week our entire first semester. In fact, he flunked out because he was drunk constantly. Uh, but also, too, I mean, even the, um, even the, the, you know, arguably the greatest theologian of the, uh, of the, of the modern era for the, for the Mennonites uh, was well known for some that uh, he was uh, abusing people sexually. Mm -hmm. And it was hidden, it was kept under wraps, uh, the, and they knew about it for 20 plus years and it was just allowed to persist and fester. And I can't even imagine that that would have ever been yeah. the case yeah. in the 16th century, the beginning of the 16th century mm -hmm. for, uh, for the signers of the, of the Schleitheim Confessions, Bam. for instance. Um, you just wouldn't have had that. So uh, what I've found there is it's oftentimes, it's, it's as if it's just very similar to what we have in Baptist life. There's a cultural Baptist life, and then there are Baptists who are truly committed to a life of, of ongoing repentance and devotion and commitment communally. Um, but even there, they, they, many modern Anabaptists have kind of become, they become a cultural form of, or cultural character of what they, they mm -hmm. were really intended to be. Ironic. Mm -hmm. So let's open the floor back up. Who will be our next uh, interrogator? Okay. The Venerable Dr. Sam Williams. So kind of following along this line, um, uh, and I was going to ask, so are there any um, of the Anabaptist uh, denominational progeny that have carried the, the banner very well? And uh, I guess you're kind of saying not really. Oh, no. I, I think if you looked at uh, some of the more conservative, smaller Mennonite uh, uh, denominations, you would find. And the Amish, uh, but it's, it's also an attempt to remain true to scripture and also in some ways to remain true to an old culture. Uh, so you do have uh, that and uh, I think you can especially find it among the Amish. Mm -hmm. are, are you familiar with um, the Brethren in Christ? And uh, that it's a relatively small denomination but there's a, uh, a teaching pastor at the Meeting House Church in Canada named Bruxy Cavey. And he is uh, waving the Anabaptist flag a ton mm. there in, uh, in Canada. It's one of the largest uh, churches in Canada um, that's you know, mm. uh, 
evangelical, I think, for the most part. Uh, and uh, But one of the things that, I, and I've listened to him some and uh, read some of him, and uh, one of the things that he kind of pushes back, and there's a recent interview of him at, by the Gospel Coalition, um, and uh, three, three interviews of him, um, and because he, he refuses to um, espouse the word inerrancy and said, that's just not how we think about Scripture. Uh, those were your battles. Those aren't our battles. Um, and so with respect to anabaptism and inerrancy, what, what are your comments about that? I've, I, I, that's, a, that's a great question. In my research into the 16th century Anabaptists, they would use words like unerring and infallible. Um, and so they didn't face the historical critical method like we have. Um, but as with most Christians throughout Christian history, they held to a form of the inerrancy of Scripture. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I would say if you were looking at the 16th century Anabaptists, you would find that they were inerrantists. Yeah, now there is, and just to qualify this a bit, and, and Dr. Yarnell is, is fully aware of this, you know, the term Anabaptist is really pregnant with meaning. It's, it's a pejorative that's attached to the group, and it covers a host of different people. And so, because it's not their term, it's a term that's applied to them. It's applied equally across the board to various, very different, and you, Dr. Hammond alluded to this, right? I mean, you've got... You've got the, the, the Swiss evangelical Anabaptists that emerge out of, out of Zurich. They become non-resistant separatists all the way to the Anabaptist kingdom of Muster. We're going to cut your head off if you don't believe like us. That's, very, that's a very different form of Anabaptism. Um, and so there are figures, for instance, like Thomas Munzer, who is, is considered an Anabaptist, a radical reformer. Uh, he, he would hold to a very different view of this. And he would, he would actually say that, you know, you can, you can have, you wouldn't even have to have the Bible. If you have the Spirit of God, you could have as true a form of Christianity without special revelation altogether. And that's certainly a very spiritualistic borderline mystical way of thinking about things. He's still characterized by many as an Anabaptist. So it's whenever we get into this, this discussion about the Anabaptists, it's always, always hard to have because it is such a large swath of people. And, and it's, not, uh, it's not just that we don't understand who they are, even their own contemporaries. I mean, one of the things that I love is in, in 1530, um, Heinrich Bullinger, Zwingli's successor in Zurich, uh, he writes about the Anabaptists and he says, the Anabaptists are relying too much on the spirit. They're not following the letter of scripture. They, this is leading them into errors. In 1531, less than 18 months later, he comes back and in his correspondence, he says, the Anabaptists are relying too much on the literal straightforward reading of the word of God. And you, you sort of look, step back and what is going on here you know, have the Anabaptists changed their position so dramatically? Well, of course not. But what's what's happened is even Zwingli, I mean, even Bullinger, who's in the midst of the this burgeoning movement, he can't tell the difference himself from these various manifestations of of, of Reformation figures. And so um, it would it would be very much even you know today. You're going to have vibrant forms of Anabaptism. You're going to have you know non-vibrant forms. You're going to have forms that Fall, you know, fall in line with the sufficiency and the authority and the reliability of Scripture, whether they would use the word inerrancy or not um, it might, might be different for different people, but then you're going to have some that, that are very much going to be you know, embracing some of the, the more modern ways of thinking about Scripture. Yeah, this, this church in, in Canada, uh, uh, with respect to some of the other Anabaptist stuff, the non-resistance, non-violence, pacifism stuff, they, they won't even allow... Uh, uh, law enforcement officers mm -hmm. or military mm -hmm. persons uh, to be members in their church. Yeah. Now, they're very, they, they embrace them. It's a very kind-hearted uh, church, generally yeah. speaking. But when it comes to membership, they want these people in their church, but they, they just feel that they can't allow them to be members because they do not embrace the pacifism. Yeah. And this is what separated the early Baptists from the Anabaptists. I mean... Uh, when John Smith and his small congregation fled the Gainsborough area and went into the Netherlands, into Amsterdam, 
they rented a bakehouse as a large complex in which to live, and they worshiped there as well, uh, from an Anabaptist, uh, Jan Munter. And that's where they came to Baptist convictions. Later, Smith tried to join with uh, the, the Mennonites in the area. And whatever they did, uh, one of their members, the leading layman uh, by the name of Thomas Hellis, uh, Hellis uh, said, no, we can't do that. Uh, first of all, we've got a baptism already, and we don't have to get it from a succession. Uh, secondly, uh, there, uh, the, the Mennonites in that area had a, uh, a, a view of Christ uh, that involved uh, the celestial flesh, which he considered to be at least an error, if not a heresy, and so he didn't want to unite with them over the Christology. Um, but also, uh, it, it had to do with whether uh, a, 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 a true Christian could be a magistrate, could bear the sword on behalf of the state. Yeah. And, uh, and Hellas said, yes, they can. And so, I mean, this is, a, this is why Baptists and uh, Mennonites have departed from one another. I do want to uh, piggyback on something. You brought up Bullinger. Bullinger once wrote a book on the origin, the Ursprung of the Anabaptists. And he argued uh, that the Anabaptists did not come from Zurich. Uh, they came from Thomas Munzer, who, by the way, was never baptized himself. Um, and the Zwickau prophets and Wittenberg. Karl Stott. Yeah, so Karl Stott and Wittenberg. That's, so it's a way for the Reformed to put the blame on Luther, mm -hmm. right? Um, but ultimately, <laughs> Bullinger said they came from the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of perverse, uh, polemical historiography was the standard for understanding the origin of the Anabaptists uh, from uh, Catholics, uh, from uh, Lutherans who dealt with the Munzer phenomenon, uh, and uh, uh, from the Reformed up until the mid-20th century when these Mennonite scholars uh, like Bender uh, were actually going and looking at the original records themselves and at the writings of the early Anabaptists themselves and came to the conclusion uh, that there had been a gross m misrepresentation uh, going on. Mm -hmm. And as you go and actually read the records for yourself, you find that the historiography that carried into the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, early 20th century textbooks, and still carry into a, a lot of the polemics against the Anabaptists, you discover that, that uh, there are gross misrepresentations that are not even reading the original source material, which, by the way, as PhD students, it's very important to privilege the primary sources. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you don't, <laughs> then your supervisors would <laughs> and should take you to the woodshed. Uh, but there are a lot of historical, uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, metaphorically, um, lower your grade, we'll put it in a, in a literal way, um, letter. <laughs> so yes, I, 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 there has been a gross misrepresentation, but as you go back and you read the original sources for yourself, you find a, a picture of the Radical Reformation that includes not just Anabaptists, there are other, there are spiritualists, there are rationalists, there are anti-Trinitarians, that the evangelical Anabaptists, and these are the ones that, that, that we focus upon, the evangelical Anabaptists disagree with them. They exclude them from their communities. They write against them. But when you look at Balthazar Hubmeyer, Pilgrim Marpeck, Michael Sattler, uh, and uh, the, the people that followed the Schleidheim Confession, when you look at uh, Dirk Phillips and Menno Simons, you find something that is much more like what we see uh, as our own preferences as evangelical Baptists today. Mm -hmm. And so, but you've got to make these distinctions, and past historiography has done violence to the truth, uh, which follows upon their own violence to the Anabaptists themselves. Those are the misrepresentations I mentioned at the first. There's still some common yeah. ideas out there, on the lay level especially, about these uh, wild Anabaptists who were mm -hmm. heretics and those like that. So we've got time, I think, for one or maybe two more questions. Who will be next? Our distinguished librarian. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Dougal McLaurin. I'm Old Testament uh, PhD student. Uh, my question is two parts. Uh, first, uh, Karl Barth in his Good and Good and Dogmatics talks about the problem of the Catholic Church is there's a uh, pope, and the problem of Protestants is that everyone's a pope. <laughs> And so the first part of my question is, uh, when we talk about uh, reading scripture and, and sola scriptura in the way that the Anabaptists did, uh, could that have led to an individualistic interpretation and thus kind of move towards this broad scope of, you know, all these different uh, thinking groups were Anabaptists in that sense, like, um, you know, just kind of the, the broad group that are Anabaptists. Yeah. And then secondly, were there any uh, groups that held to uh, held tradition in any uh, respect in their interpretation, and if so, um, or if they didn't, uh, what would be our response to that? And let me uh, let me jump in here. I want us to have a chance to answer at least one more question. So let's limit to one panelist for now. Did you have a particular panelist in mind? Uh, Dr. Yarnell. Okay. Um, let me answer the first part of your question, uh, and then quickly answer the second part. So the the. The, the first part of the question is, is that for the evangelical Anabaptists, this, uh, what is really a Roman Catholic polemic against Protestantism that has been adopted by many Protestants because of the effect of the Enlightenment is not true of the 16th century Anabaptists. The 16th century Anabaptists took covenant seriously, and they also believed in a communal form of hermeneutics. They were not radical individualists. They did have radical conversion. Uh, they were born again, uh, they were baptized, uh, and they became churchmen and churchwomen. And when they read the scripture, they followed uh, Ciceract or Lex Sedentium, the law of sitting of 1 Corinthians 14. Let one prophet stand, and then when he's done, the others will make a judgment. And then let the next stand, and that's what they did. Their, their worship services were organized Often they were organized scriptural interpretation exercises. And so they engaged in a, commu a communal form of hermeneutics. Uh, this, uh, this presentation of them as radical individualists is, is not true. And by the way, the same is not true of Luther, who's also often uh, tagged mm -hmm. with that, you know, being the father of radical individualism and sectarianism and so on, that's, that's not true. As far as the claim of, you know, uh, Protestants have many popes or, you know, millions of popes, I'd rather have a million popes than one. <laughs> because I do think, uh, I'd rather not have, if we're using the word pope in its uh, polemical way as somebody who has an infallible uh, proclamation, I'd rather not have popes at all. But I'd rather have diffuse authority than one single authority uh, because I do believe that the Spirit inhabits the church, which means the whole church. Um, as far as tradition, the, Anabap the evangelical Anabaptists used the Apostles' Creed. You can find a, a copy of the Athanasian Creed, which comes out in his writings in uh, the collections of uh, Pilgrim Marpeck and his community. And uh, uh, Schemer and Schlaffer and many others actually write uh, Hubmeier. They deal with the Apostles' Creed. So they're depending upon the tradition. The thing with tradition is, is they were emphatic that what happened with Constantine, mm -hmm. yes. what happened with the overwhelming introduction of infant baptism, is that the church fell in the 4th century. And there was an influx uh, of a massive number of people that were not true Christians. And so the church lost its holiness. And that the church needed to be recovered, reclaimed. And, uh, and so they had a, an historiography that emphasized the early church and de-emphasized the medieval church. Let me highlight too here with this that I think is so important. It ties in with this idea of them recognizing the fall as early as fourth century as opposed to a medieval fall, which would be Luther and the, and the Magisterial Reformers' conviction. Um, and it speaks also to this sense of a, of a hermeneutical community. What this all hinges upon is a regenerate church membership. That, that's why they, that's why as they slowly came to realize this church was to be, 
a gathered body of committed believers together, the, the only way to come to a right interpretation and understanding of Scripture is if you gather true believers who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit to get at that interpretation. Uh, and so for them, this is why... This is why that regenerate church membership is is so crucial. Not just that it was to be this distinct community as a witness to the transforming power of the gospel. It was that, but it was also to preserve the the orthodoxy and the and the sound theology uh, of the of the community as well. And it's what's most interesting to me in all of this is, especially with the the evangelical Anabaptist in the Zurich area. This is exactly what they had been trained to do. This is what they had been taught to do by their master Zwingli when he loosed a, a hermeneutic of community onto Zurich. The, the ministers of the Zurich church gathered together. This is before Calvin's Geneva and the, and the company of pastors. They're meeting together as ministers, as pastors, and they're, they're meeting to, they're, and they're, they're talking about the text. They're going, by the way, those of you who are, are in Old Testament, New Testament, they're, they're actually getting into the original Greek and the original Hebrew, letting the word of God wash over them corporately then they're taking that back into their communities. Zwingli encourages small group Bible studies in the home. These, these, these communities just gathered around the Word of God. And that's what's transformed Zurich in the, in the early part of the 1520s. It was only when this group began to kind of see and push him on what they saw in Scripture that Zwingli pulls the reins back in. And there's a really important question here. And how, how far do you get ahead of the people in terms of these changes? Um, we can say that, that you know, Zwingli is politically expedient. He's also, in some respects, being a pastor. He's, he's not wanting to, he knows that just instituting, you know, certain measures and doctrines isn't going to mean that the people's hearts are changed. But for them, and this is, this is where for them the, the second Zerk disputation is really, and this goes back to the Word of God, is what's so crucial in all of this. They, they saw the Word as being normative. It was, it was the final authority. It wasn't the only authority. But for them, they wanted to hang their hat on Scripture, but a Scripture that was read and appropriated and lived out in that, in that community of, of believers. So I'm going to ask the last question, and I think it'll be a question that will benefit everyone in the room, and then we'll uh, wrap up for the day. <clears throat> I'd like to ask each of the panelists, if they would, to rec recommend one or two resources, uh, that, uh, whether that be books or articles or websites or videos, just a couple of resources for those of us who would like to read further on the Anabaptists. So this is a very difficult question for Anabaptist scholars to answer because they've got hundreds of resources they'd like to recommend. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll put you on the spot, yeah. a couple, a piece. Let's uh, tell you what, let's start with uh, Dr. Hammett and we'll... Oh, so some of our privileged primary sources, uh, Balthasar Hubmeyer on the Christian Baptism of Believers. Mm -hmm. It is as current today as it was 500 years ago. And you had us read it in yeah. our PhD seminar, yeah. Ecclesiology. Okay, uh, Dr. Yarnell? Well, you just stole what I was going to tell you. Uh, but I, I would say all of Humeyer's works, you can get them in a volume uh, that is still in uh, publication, but uh, I think it's entitled Theologian of Anabaptism, and it's the writings of, uh, of Balthazar Humeyer. Online, uh, gameo.org, G-A-M-E-O dot O-R-G, uh, contains uh, the old and revised uh, articles about almost everything Anabaptist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so it's the Anabaptist Mennonite Encyclopedia Online. Uh, so Global Anabaptist Mennonite uh, Encyclopedia Online. And if you want to look into a particular Anabaptist or to an event or to one of their denominations, gameo.org. Um, I mentioned the, the movie earlier, uh, so for those of you like Dr. Mullins who aren't good at reading, don't like to read, and you just want sort of a, a Cliff Notes version, mm, that's, what, uh, that that's what I would go with. <laughs> that was good. Um, but, uh, but let me just highlight two things. Um, one, in terms of the secondary literature, there's a lot that's out there. Um, I, I've found a tremendous amount of value from the work of Hans-Jürgen Gertz. Uh, he's more of a social historian than a confessional historian, but he also looks at this much more broadly and will help to highlight the, the distinctions and the delineations between these very uh, 
different groups of Anabaptists. Uh, so he actually has a, a book that's just called The Anabaptist. It's a good entry level work. Get the one in the library. It's super expensive to purchase yourself. Uh, and then in terms of reading, uh, we would all, Hoopmeyer would be our, would be our standard go-to. I would encourage you to read two other people on the, on the edges and the periphery. Uh, I think Carl Stott is fantastic to read. Uh, very interesting. It's, uh, it's a different take on this. Uh, uh, Dougal talked about the private interpretation of Scripture. That's Carl Stodd. If you've got the spirit, you've got the key, get in there and interpret it. Um, you know, Carl Stodd is fascinating. He's been, ar- he's, he's, he's been argued by some uh, to be the father of Baptist movements. Some of the things that we see uh, early on in Carl Stodd, uh, we also will find uh, in, later, in later Baptists. Uh, again, getting there in a different way. Carl Stodd's interesting, and uh, as well, uh, I've always been enamored with Thomas Munzer. Uh, don't follow his theology to its logical ends. He eventually got his head cut off, uh, but he's a, he's a fascinating case study in the way in which people were reading the scriptures um, and the way in which people were preaching, so his sermon to the princes, uh, um, things like that, his prog manifesto. Those things to me always always fascinate me to to kind of show you a different a different swath or a different type of of, of Anabaptism. And, and was, you, you got to read the Schleim Confession, you know, the major confession. It's short, uh, but it's the stand, it's kind of mainline evangelical Anabaptist. And then, Doctor Yonair, would you uh, land the plane for us by recommending? one or two secondary sources that sort of interpret Anabaptism as a whole? Yeah, yeah. I would point to two. You mentioned uh, Esteps, uh, the Anabaptist story. It's in its third edition, I think, now, and uh, that's a great introduction, great introductory work. Uh, but the uh, go-to resource for scholars is the uh, massive, uh, the, the Radical Reformation by George Hunston Williams, uh, who used to be the dean at Harvard uh, Divinity School, and he has gathered, it goes beyond the Anabaptists, yeah, yeah. but it is the go-to resource for uh, the history uh, of European Anabaptism, and it will uh, uh, go geographically and time-wise throughout the whole movement. It's massive, but I think it's still very, very helpful.